And now on BBC One, Patrick Moore discusses Auriga the Charioteer, a prominent feature in the sky at night. Good evening, and as this is our first program of 1994, I hope it's not too late to wish you all a very happy new year. If you look straight overhead after dark, you will see there a very brilliant star, Capella in the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer. And here's a photograph of the area taken by Douglas Arnold. And Capella is that bright star fairly near the top. We've deliberately dimmed the photograph down, but if we bring it up again, you will see the fainter stars, and you can see that the entire area is very rich indeed. In fact, Auriga is very close to the Milky Way and one of the richest areas in the entire sky. I don't think you have any trouble in finding it because Capella is so bright. But in case of doubt, you can always go back to Orion, the hunter, which dominates the evening sky all through the winter. And there's the diagram of Orion with the red Betelgeuse and the brilliant white Rigel, and the hunter's retinue with the Aldebaran and the bull, the twins, and of course, Auriga itself. Now, Auriga is known as the cosmic charioteer. There are many legends in the sky, and Auriga is said to represent Eric Thonius, one of the sons of the goddess Athene, who became king of Athens and invented the four-horse chariot, which is presumably why he was placed in the sky, and he's certainly very prominent. The four main stars of Auriga make up a rather distorted quadrilateral. Of course, Capella is dominant. Then we have Beta, or Mencarlina, Iota, or Hasselet, and Theta. These, of course, are Greek letters. Way back in the year 1603, Johann Bayer introduced a system whereby the stars in each constellation were allotted Greek letters, beginning with Alpha and working their way through. So Capella is actually Alpha Aurigi, the brightest star in the constellation. Some of the stars do have individual names, but they are not generally used except for the very brightest stars and a few other special ones. But coming back to Auriga, in addition to the quadrilateral, there is another star called Alnaf, which looks very much as though it belongs to the pattern. And it used to do so because it was the third brightest star in the constellation. It was known as Gamma Aurigi, Gamma being the third letter of the Greek alphabet. But then, for some reason I can't understand, the International Astronomical Union decided to give it a free transfer. And they took it away from Auriga, and they gave it to the adjacent constellation of Taurus the Bull. So instead of being Gamma Aurigi, it became Beta Tauri. And that does seem to me rather illogical, because it does clearly belong to the Auriga pattern. And Taurus the Bull, although it's a bright constellation, has no particularly distinctive shape. You can't really make a bull out of that. Of course, the most famous objects in Taurus are the two star clusters, the V formation of the Hyades, coming away from Aldebaran, and the lovely Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, the grandest open cluster in the entire sky. Incidentally, how many stars in the Pleiades can you see with the naked eye on a really clear, dark night? You should be able to manage at least seven. Some people can manage more. And I believe the record by a last century German astronomer named Hayes is 19. But if you're seeing, you can see 12, you're doing very well indeed. And there's nebulosity there too. Not easy to see visually, but very easy to photograph. But the bull has no particularly distinctive shape. And I don't think it really should lay logical claim to Alnath. Nevertheless, there it is. So Alnath is now in Taurus and not in Auriga. So let's come back now to Capella. As I've said, um, it's a yellow star the same color as the sun, and it's 42 light years away. Remember, the stars are very remote. We can't measure the distances easily in miles or kilometers, so instead we use the light year. Light flashes along at 186,000 miles a second, and so in a year it covers nearly 6 million million miles, and that is the astronomical light year. So we see Capella as it used to be 42 years ago, uh, shortly before I began doing the Sky at Night program. And of course, the nearest star beyond the sun is rather over four light years away. But Capella is not, in fact, a single star. The same color as the sun, much more luminous, and it's made up of two. And these two components go around their common center of gravity, making up what we call a binary system. We know their distances. They are 70 million miles apart. Their paths are nearly circular around their common center of gravity. 
The large star has a diameter of 11 million miles and the smaller one 6 million miles and they're both brighter than the Sun. The larger star has 90 times the Sun's luminosity and the smaller star 70. But we can't see them individually and therefore how do we know that Capella really is a double and not a single star? And the answer is by using the spectroscope. Just as a telescope collects light, so a spectroscope splits light up. When you look at the spectrum of a star, what you see is a rainbow band crossed by dark lines. The rainbow band is due to the gaseous surface of the star, and the dark lines are produced by gases in what we can call the star's atmosphere. And every line is responsible for one particular element or group of elements. For example, look in the yellow part of the spectrum, and you'll see there are two prominent dark lines. And they are due to the element sodium, and they can't be due to anything else. So we know that there is sodium in stars like the Sun, and for that matter, in Capella. So we can tell what the stars are made of. But we can tell something else as well. We can tell the ways in which the stars are moving. And this is by using what's known as the Doppler effect. Well, I'm sure you're familiar with this. If you listen to um, an ambulance or a police car going by with the siren sounding, you know that the note of the sound drops as the thing pass by, passes by you. It goes, ooh. And the reason for that is that when a source of sound is moving away from you, fewer sound waves per second enter your ear than would be the case if the sound source was standing still. So the wavelength is effectively lengthened and the note drops. If the source is approaching you, the wavelength is apparently shortened and the note of the horn or the whistle is raised. You get the same kind of thing with light, but this time it affects the color. If a source of light is moving away from you, the wavelength is effectively lengthened and the object appears a little too red. Now the color change doesn't notice, but in the star spectrum all the lines are shifted over to the long wavelength or red end of the band. If the source is approaching you, the shift is to the blue and in that way we can tell the approach or recession of velocity of the star. Now, of course, Capella has a general velocity compared with the Earth, but if you think about it, you'll realize that as the two components go around their common center of gravity, there must be times when one star is approaching us and will have its lines blue shifted, while the other star is receding and will have its lines red shifted. At other times, the motion is transverse and there are no Doppler shifts at all. And therefore, when this happens, the lines are doubled, and the fact that the lines are doubled indicates that Capella really is not one star, but two. It's what's called a spectroscopic binary, and there are plenty of those in the sky, but Capella is a very good example of it. Now let's come back to the main constellation itself. As I say, there's a rather distorted quadrilateral, Capella, Beta, Mancolina, Iota, and Theta. Now that looks distinctive enough, but in point of fact, as I've said many times, the stars in any particular constellation are not genuinely associated with each other because the stars are at very different distances from us and we are dealing with nothing more significant than a line of sight effects. And in Ordega, those stars are not in any way associated. Capella is much the closest and Iota is much the furthest away. Let me show you what I mean. Now, there we have the pattern as we see it from Earth and those stars lie roughly in the same line of sight. But now let's put them in to their actual distances from the Earth. Capella there over to the left, Iota over to the right. And you will see that in fact they are not in any way associated with each other. And Iota is very much the furthest away, 270 light years as against 82 for Theta, 72 for Beta, and only 42 for Capella. And Iota is also much the most luminous, about 7,000 times as bright as our sun, whereas the combined luminosity of both the capellas is less than 200 sun power. And it shows that a constellation is really nothing at all significant. But now, in Auriga, there are two stars which are of exceptional interest. If you look near Capella, you'll see a little triangle of rather fainty stars, and they are known as the Kids. One of them, Eta Aurigae is a perfectly ordinary white star, about 200 times as powerful as our sun. The apex star is Epsilon, which does have a proper name, Al Mars, but it's hardly ever used. And the faintest of the kids is Zeta, which does have a proper name, Sagittarius, used rather more often than I think it would normally be. 
but both epsilon and zeta are very strange objects indeed. So let's begin with epsilon. The star we can see is an exceptionally luminous yellow supergiant. It's about 200,000 times more powerful than our sun, and the distance is 4,600 light years, so it's a very long way away indeed. Normally, the magnitude is about three. As I'm sure you know, stars are divided, are divided into grades or magnitudes of apparent brilliancy, uh, rather like a golfer's handicap. The brighter stars have the lower figure, so magnitude one brighter than magnitude two and so on. And uh, normally, Epsilon Origri shines as a star of about the third magnitude, rather fainter than the main stars in the Great Bear or Plough. But every 27 years, it fades down and gives a long, slow wink to about the fourth magnitude. Now, it did that last in the 1980s, and I made quite a lot of observations of it. And here is the light curve, the magnitude on the left and the dates along the bottom. And between 1982 and 1984, there was a long minimum. And between January 1983 and January 1984, the star was about a magnitude fainter than usual. Now, there are many variable stars in the sky, but Epsilon Origi doesn't appear to be one, at least not in the accepted sense of the word. It looks very much as though those variations are caused not by intrinsic fluctuations in the star itself, but by something coming in between the bright star and us. That would make it an eclipsing binary. And there are plenty of those around. Algon and Perseus is one. But Epsilon Origi has an exceptionally long period, 27 years. And the, remar the remarkable thing is that no trace of the eclipsing companion has ever been seen. It sends out no visible light we can pick up, and there are no indications of its spectrum either. So what exactly is it? The variations were discovered way back in 1821 by a German astronomer named Fritsch. But the eclipsing binary theory cropped up much later. And at first, it was supposed that the invisible eclipsing companion must be a really huge star, shining very dimly and not yet hot enough to send out visible light. And in that case, it really would be immense. If its center were where the center of the sun is, then the star would extend right out beyond the orbit of Saturn, and it would be the largest star known to science. Now, that seems plausible enough, but there are various things wrong with the theory. To start with, it's very difficult to imagine a star of that size, however tenuous, which would be transparent so that the light of the supergiant could shine through it. Secondly, would it be stable and near a very massive star, and the primary is at least 35 solar masses, I think the answer is probably not. And then there would probably be a change in color, because if the light from the supergiant came through a large transparent star, it would be reddened and there's no sign at all of any color change. So all in all, the really large star theory doesn't, I think, add up. Theory number two, this time the eclipsing companion is not an ordinary star at all, but a kind of disk of matter that passes in front of the main star and cuts out part of the light, bisects it, so to speak. But again, the problem there is that it's very hard to see how a disk of that kind could be stable so close to a very massive star. And I think the answer is that it couldn't, so that theory is out also. Theory number three. This time, the invisible companion is simply a black hole. Now, we've heard a great deal about black holes recently. We talked about them last sky at night. But we know now that a black hole is, in fact, a very massive star that has collapsed and is now pulling so strongly that not even light can get away from it. And if light can't escape, then certainly nothing else can, because light is the fastest thing in the universe. And it's been suggested, therefore, that the masking companion of Epsilon Origi could simply be a black hole surrounded by what we call an accretion disk. But there are problems there, too. Obviously, we can't see black holes. They send out no radiation at all. On the other hand, we can normally detect them, because a black hole pulls material away from its companion, and before that material is sucked down into the black hole to disappear forever, it's very intensely heated, and that makes it give off X-rays. And there's no sign of any X-ray radiation at all from Epsilon Origi. And that, I think, indicates that there probably isn't a black hole there. So we come to theory number four. This time, the eclipsing companion is a small, fairly hot star, surrounded by a huge shell of opaque matter. And it's that shell which hides the supergiant. And although we can't be sure, it does look very much as though that is the case. Certainly, Epsilon Origi is unique, 
There's nothing else quite like it in the sky, so far as we know, and the next eclipse is not due until the year 2009. Until then, it'll go on looking like a perfectly ordinary, innocent third magnitude star. Now, I'll come now to the fainter of the three kids, Zeta Aurigae, or Sadatoni. And this also is an eclipsing binary. And again, we have a red supergiant, not nearly so luminous or so remote as Epsilon. But this time, we can see the spectrum of the companion, which is a smaller and very hot star. When the companion goes behind the red supergiant, there's a period when its light is shining through the supergiant's outer layers, and there are very complicated spectral changes, which, of course, are repeated at the eclipse's end. And there's nothing else quite like that known, so it can tell us a great deal about the way in which the zeta Aurigae system is made up. And I wonder, what would it look like from close range? Would it be anything like this? I suspect it would. I doubt if there is a planetary system there. It doesn't need to be that suitable kind of star, but certainly the effect would be highly dramatic. Coming back to Auriga, there's another star, A.E. Aurigae, just on the fringe of naked eye visibility, which is not particularly notable in itself, but is very notable because of its movement. It's associated with nebulosity, known as the Flaming Star Nebula, and it's moving in a very curious kind of way. I think most people know the great nebula in Oran, Messier 42, which you can see with the naked eye below the three stars of the Hunter's Belt. And in any small telescope, it really is a glorious sight. Well, it appears that A. E. Aurigae and two other stars, 53 Eretus and Mu Columbi, are moving away from the Orion Nebula at high velocity in different directions, moving at the same rate and now about the same distance from the nebula. And the inference is that they actually came from the nebula and were shot out in some way that we don't entirely understand. And that's why they're known as the runaway stars. I've said that Auriga is a very rich region. In addition to the numerous star fields, there are three splendid open clusters, M36, 37 and 38. M standing for Messier, because these clusters were catalogued way back in 1781 by the French astronomer Charles Messier. Now, there are plenty of open clusters in the sky, but these three are particularly defined, and they're shown on this lovely photograph by Harold Ridley, running obliquely across the picture, and from bottom left to top right, 37, 36 and 38. They are all in the same binocular field, and they make up a grand sight. They're all between 2,000 and 4,000 light years away. So all in all, I think we'd agree that there's plenty to see and plenty of interest in the cosmic charioteer, and it's going to be on view all through the evenings throughout winter. Before I go, don't forget that if you want the latest information, then dial up our Sky at Night information line, 0891 800 or CFAX, page 685. And it's newsletter time, so if you want the newsletter, then as usual, send your stamped address envelope to newsletter number 52, The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London, W12, 7RJ. When I come back next month, I'm going to do a rather unusual program. I'm going to talk about the names of the objects in the sky. So until then, once again, a very happy new year. And until next month, good night.